Hey everyone, welcome back to Crime After Crime. I'm John Lorden, and it's our Valentine's Day crime episode, but it's Valentine's Day and I'm here alone. Unfortunately, Danielle could not be here today. She's got some personal things going on. She needed a little bit of a breather, but she is coming back next month. Well, what does that mean for today's episode? You guys just going to hear one story from me and then not have anything to vote on or vote on me for two different things? I don't, I don't know. No way. No, 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 no. This is crime after crime. So we have a special guest that's going to help us out and we're going to make this a special episode on top of that. And guess what? She's appeared on this show before. A big welcome to Stephanie Harlow. Hey, Steph. Hi, how are you? Good. Very good. Thank you so much for stepping in and helping out. It's great to have you here. Uh, I just want to say before we get started, I love your work. I love how into history you are. Um, your research, the way you pull stories together on your channel is really, really amazing. Really oh, good work. Thank you so much. Oh, you're very Same. Welcome. Are you kidding? Same. <laughs> no, no. And thank you. Um, it was so cool that, uh, you know, when Danielle said, hey, I just need a little time. Uh, the first thing I thought was, I need to talk to Stephanie Harlow and like within 12 minutes, it was like done. Okay, we're <laughs> yeah. going to do it. It's so cool. It was very you. easy. Yeah. Thank you so much. Oh, so, my pleasure. What does this mean? Because, um, you know, Stephanie, you know, the format of the show, this is an ongoing competition. We're usually going for the whole thing. That means that for this particular episode, um, we are not going to do the voting results from last episode. I'm going to save those until Danielle gets back, and then we're going to continue our competition against each other. Now, what's good is having you here is actually going to solve a little bit of a problem for us. At the end of season one, we were tied. It was 6-6, six, six. So, and we had to go to the numbers, which, by the way, she won, but only by, it was a little over 1%. <laughs> Um, so she got the crime after crime trophy for this episode. We're doing this as a standalone competition, just me versus Stephanie Harlow. And we're going to do something special for it. We're going to do a donation to a charity that the winner picks. So Stephanie, who is your charity that you're playing for? Um, I, I'm just always been a big fan of St. Jude's Children's Hospital. Uh, I know people that they've helped. I know they're a really great organization. Um, most people who are on my channel know I have a very big, big soft spot in my heart for children. Uh, so it, it would be St. Jude's. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's great. Um, I literally made a donation to them for a case that I covered last month where mm -hmm. the family was asking for that um, for their deceased loved one. So mm -hmm. yeah, that they're very close to my heart as well. But in the interest of competition, the charity I'm playing for will be the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. So you guys, your vote still counts. Whoever wins this episode, we're going to make a donation to their particular charity. Before we do get started on our topic, Stephanie, where can people find your work? We might have some crime after crimesters that aren't familiar with you necessarily. So where can they find you? Um, I'm on YouTube. It's just Stephanie Harlow with an E at the end. Um, you can find me there. I'm also on Twitter, Instagram, but my, my majority of my work obviously happens on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And do you have a name for your fans? Are they Harlowites or something? Do you have? <laughs> they're, uh, they're Harlequins. <laughs> Harlequins. Perfect. <Yes. laughs> so I just want to give a very big welcome to any Harlequins that might pop in and check out your appearance here. Hey guys, thank you so much for joining hey. us on Crime After Crime. All right, today's topic is Valentine's Day crimes. Now, there are several theories and legends as to what actually started Valentine's Day. And surprisingly, one of them features a crime. According to Encyclopedia Britannica, which, um, Stephanie, I don't know if you remember, but that used to be the way that you learned things before the internet. Isn't that funny? <laughs> I mean, seriously, people would have 30 books in a shelf that were Encyclopedia Britannica. Um, yeah, we really don't see that anymore. But can uh, you imagine that you want to know something and now you just Google it within five seconds, you know it. And before seriously. you'd have to be like, oh, let me light a candle. <laughs> <laughs> pull my encyclopedia out it's insane yeah. i can't even imagine yeah absolutely the good old days uh and not to mention they would have the salesman that would come by and knock on the door mm -hmm. and try to sell you an updated encyclopedia uh, but according to encyclopedia britannica the holiday has origins in the roman festival of lupercalia 
held in mid-February. The festival included the pairing off of women with men by lottery. What do you think of that system? Something we should bring back? I mean, I feel like every relationship you get in, you're playing the lottery, right? (laughs) (laughs) Well said. You could win, you could lose. (laughs) That's very true. Uh, At the end of the 5th century, Pope Jealousius, which I'm curious why his name has the word jealous in it um he uh jealousius jealousius i wrote it out so that i would pronounce it right that's that's why it looks funny um the first he replaced lupercalia with saint valentine's day now although there were several christian martyrs named valentine a common legend states that saint valentine defied an emperor's orders which would be a crime by secretly marrying couples to spare the husbands from war The emperor had outlawed marriage because he believed it was weakening his forces. In that legend, I believe the priest is eventually beheaded, which, of course, nowadays means that we should all buy cards, flowers, and candy for each other. I don't don't know how it yeah I don't know how it connects, (laughs) but well, if you want to go down a rabbit hole, do a search on Hallmark invented Valentine's Day. Now, Hallmark says they did not invent it and that the first Valentine was sent in 1849. That didn't actually, well, they didn't actually offer Valentine's Day's cards until 1913. But there's many other websites that accuse Hallmark of doing just that and creating other atrocities like Secretary's Day, Grandparents' Day, and most evil of all, Boss's Day. Absolutely. Now, I know you're not big on cards either, right? Do you Mm-mm. think, do you buy into this thing that Hallmark actually started this industry? I wouldn't put it past them. It, it was it was a good idea, you know, great uh, marketing idea. Yeah. But yeah. Well, I wouldn't thing, put it past them. The thing that got me, and I, I tried to look into this to figure it out, is I was remembering when I was a kid, one of the most confusing things that would happen when I was in school is that whole idea that on Valentine's Day you were supposed to bring a card for every member of your class? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I tried to figure out who started that because that's that's the real racket, you know. Get them when they're kids, and not only are they buying one card for someone they're interested in, no, you need thirty cards, you know, with uh, little crappy lollipops attached to them for everyone in the class. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. Those lollipops are good. The red hearts <laughs> with like the white writing on them, they're so good. I they think it depends like where lifesavers. Yeah, I think it depends where you buy them because I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. pretty sure I didn't I didn't get those good ones. <laughs> um, when I was looking into it, I did find out that they now call them friendship exchanges, which mm-hmm. I think is kind of cool, and I'm I'm glad they addressed that because. I always felt a little funny giving cards to certain people in the class. So many, so many people. Yeah, that's just me. <laughs> um, of course, when talking about Valentine's Day crimes, you can't skip over the St. Valentine's Day massacre. While it's not going to be one of our main stories that we're covering here today, its connection to Valentine's Day and true crime media is very important. Um, So it was 1929, right? Alcohol was prohibited. Gangsters were running rampant in Chicago. Seven members of the North Side gang headed by Bugs Moran were lined up against a wall and shot by four men dressed like police officers. Well, the crime's still unsolved to this day, though it's suspected that the suspects may have been connected to Al Capone and possibly some some members, some members of the Chicago Police Department members. (laughs) (laughs) This particular case would change true crime media forever, according to what I learned by watching Crimes That Made History on Magellan TV. The front page news was now using the word massacre, which hadn't happened before. They were showing pictures of victims' bodies with no edits, where previously they would use giant X's. They would put giant X's over people's faces or you know, um, the trauma that had happened to their bodies. And the public was hungry for more as this real-life crime drama unfolded daily in the press. 90 years later, true crime is still a staple of our news media and storytelling. And one of the best mediums for that content is the documentary. Well, today's YouTube version of Crime After Crime is sponsored by Magellan TV, and I love Magellan TV. I've been using it for a while. The Crimes That Made History documentary you brought up so so good i also like um 
a lot of their other true crime documentaries. But the good thing about Magellan TV is that it's it's founded by filmmakers. So it's founded by the people who know what makes a good documentary uh, better than anybody, really. Yeah, absolutely. And they've got all kinds of different ones there. Uh, they've got history, which I know you love, mm-hmm. science, space, nature, of course, true crime. Plus, they've got 4K content and there's no additional cost for it. Uh, Stephanie, what's your favorite documentary that you've seen there? So there's a lot of um, Charles Manson documentaries on there. Yeah. Um, so anything really to do with Charles Manson, I, I did a six part series on Charles Manson on my channel. I mm. got really into it. And I think they just put a new Manson, Charles Manson documentary on there recently. So yeah, I'm abso- to watch it. Absolutely. Magellan TV works on Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Apple TV, Google Play, iOS. You can watch it on your TV, laptop, or mobile device anytime, anywhere. Visit MagellanTV.com forward slash crime after crime and you'll get a month of free service. Well, give Magellan TV a try, guys. So just visit MagellanTV.com slash crime after crime today. Right now. Wait after this. Yeah. Yeah. Wait a little bit, but right after this. (laughs) All right, Stephanie, so I'm ready for it. I wanna hear this. I've been excited all week. What is your Valentine's Day crime story? This story is crazy, and I'm surprised, honestly, that I hadn't heard about it before I started kind of looking um, in the Valentine's Day realm. So on the evening of February 14th, 2010, 46-year-old Richard Shack drove to Belton Bridge Park in Georgia for a romantic rendezvous with his 38-year-old wife, Stacy. Now, if you asked anybody who knew this couple, they were very deeply in love, very happy. Um, but Richard was the kind of guy who, he was just a really all-around good guy. He fixed everything he encountered. You know, if you had a flat tire, Richard would be the guy you would go to for help. Um, And he was a hot air balloon enthusiast. He loved the outdoors. He volunteered his time leading the local Boy Scout troop. But Stacy's cousin, Connie Hearn, she said that in the past, Stacy hadn't had the best of luck with relationships. In fact, Richard was her fifth husband. Um, So Connie said that that Stacy would kind of get bored easily and move on to the next. But Connie also said that Richard was the most reliable, the best out of all of them. Um, He was respectable, kind, selfless, and even legally adopted two of Stacy's children, two of her sons from previous relationships. So Stacy, he sounds like a good guy so far. A super, super good guy, like the kind of guy you would want to marry. Yeah, especially if this was your fifth husband, you kind of hope to get it right this time. Yeah. Um, so Stacy was the head administrator at the DeKalb Spinal Clinic in Georgia, and she was the main breadwinner of the family, it seems. Uh, she also had several rental properties that I think brought her income. She had a lot of different properties in her name. So this dark Valentine's Day night, Stacy told her husband she was running late from work, that the nurse who was supposed to relieve her hadn't shown up yet. So she arranged for them to meet up at the isolated park so they could exchange gifts and cards and basically get away from the kids and, you know, make out like teenagers again and <laughs> have this this nice little romantic uh, pocket of, of, you know, being together. Yeah. So she said, head over there. I'm running a little late, but I'm going to I'm going to get out of here and meet you there as soon as I do. Well, when she arrived, she found her husband lying on the ground next to his truck riddled with bullets. So she called 911 and I heard this call and she genuinely sounds terrified, shocked, terror stricken, just panicked. Um, However, when the police arrived, they felt that the crime scene was a bit confusing. Lieutenant Dan Franklin claimed that the red flags were evident immediately. Richard had been shot five times, twice in his stomach, twice in the face, and once in the chest. And in crimes like this, the motive should really be robbery, but nothing was missing. Mm. They found $40 in the console of his truck. He was still wearing his watch, his wedding ring, and the truck with the keys in it was still there. So why would someone shoot an unarmed man so many times and then take nothing? The police decided it must have been something personal, someone who really had an ax to grind with Richard to shoot him so many times and kill him so viciously, but not take anything, or it had been a professional hit. Hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of gunshots, I think, for a professional hit. But yeah, I would certainly be wondering about that. Or maybe at least a hired hit, you could say. You know, mm-hmm. yeah. Exactly, a hired hit. Gotcha. 
Um, but at the scene, there was very little evidence. Right. Um, but the soil, it was soft. I guess it had rained recently. The soil was soft and wet. So they were able to see three sets of tire marks. Now, one set was from Richard's truck. One set was from Stacy's Ford Explorer. And one was unidentified, assuming to have belonged to the assailant. Uh, they were able to see that the unidentified tire marks had driven into the park and that they'd arrived there before Richard, almost as if they were laying in wait, as if they knew that he'd be getting there. Mm. Mm-hmm. And this isn't a very busy or populated place, right? It's not the kind of park that's you know right off the main road or there's lights there. It's, it's not as if it's meant to have people there at night. It's not lit up. There's sure. It's in the middle of nowhere. Um so it just wasn't the kind of place that you'd expect somebody to be if they weren't specifically told to be there. So while they're still at the park, the police are trying to figure out how they can use these tire tracks, this really small piece of evidence, and, and track down a suspect. But then Stacy makes a strange and unprompted confession. She told the police officers she didn't have any idea what had happened to her husband or who had done this, but she'd been having an affair with a man named Juan Reyes for years. Uh-oh. Yeah, well, it's Valentine's Day. We gotta have uh, we gotta, yeah. gotta have some some technically complicated relationships. And Definitely. once Stacy was back at the police station, she was being questioned. She gave some more details about the solicit affair. So it appeared that Juan Reyes was divorced with several children, and he didn't have a lot of financial resources. So she'd actually hired Juan at the spinal clinic that she ran to work as a surgical assistant, even though he had no prior medical training. In fact, his previous job had been a security guard at like a high class kind of posh hotel. Scary. Um, so, yeah. That is crazy scary. I, know, I felt the same way. <laughs> <laughs> What's the name of that clinic? Because I don't want to De- go there. DeKalb. DeKalb. Uh, yeah. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> it's in wow. Georgia. Um, wow. Well, this would make Juan... Not only her lover, but her subordinate. So we got some issues here. And Stacy, over the years, had basically become Juan's sugar mama. So she gave Mm -hmm. him money, um, expensive gifts. She paid for his truck payment. She paid for his cell phone bill. And she would take him on these, you know, romantic getaways, these trips for her and him. Yeah. Um, Well, when asked if she thought that he was responsible for her husband's death, she said she couldn't imagine that he would do something like that. But she didn't know for sure. So obviously Juan Reyes is is the main suspect now. Yeah. And it would make sense that maybe he'd gotten jealous and he wanted Stacy's husband out of the picture so she could continue providing for him financially. Um <laughs> not only did Juan work for Stacy, but he actually lived at one of her properties rent free. So she's she's got him at all angles. Yeah. She's responsible for his job, his house, basically his entire life. Um she also had a separate apartment that they used as a love nest. So when Juan and Stacy wanted to, to get together and, and do their thing all alone, yeah. not at her house, not at his house where his kids were, they went to this apartment. Yeah, now, now hold on a second. <laughs> so she has an apartment for her side piece, mm-hmm. but for her husband, she's saying, yeah, meet <clears throat> me at a park. Right. Wow. Come on. What's going on with this relationship? So much. <laughs> yeah. That's not nice. Well, it seemed like Stacy had essentially provided him with everything. And so he might have an interest in keeping his cash cow. You know, sometimes women have changes of heart. Oh, I'm going to make things work with my husband. Maybe he wanted to take her husband out of the picture altogether. Sure. Uh, so that wouldn't be an option. So the police went to Juan and Stacy's place of work <laughs> and they, they placed him under arrest. They brought him in for questioning. Um, And then they became more suspicious about his possible involvement because he changed his appearance recently. In the weeks leading up to Richard's death, he'd had a beard. But the day after Richard's death, Juan had shaved his beard. So that's obviously um, Mm. a little suspicious. Yeah. Yeah. Now, and the same thing happened with Scott Peterson. Do you remember? He like dyed his hair blonde and everything. (laughs) Yes, I do. Well, (laughs) when they got to the police station... Juan was really cooperative, actually, and he waived his right to a lawyer and he basically said he had nothing to do with Richard's murder. And he said he was the one who'd been pulling away from Stacy because he was trying to make things work with his (laughs) ex-wife. In fact, he and his ex had been spending quite a bit of time together and he was continuing to see Stacy basically only so she could keep giving him money and things. And so he was using her. Hmm. 
Juan also had a strong alibi for the night of the murder. He claimed that he took his seven-year-old son to Blockbuster. They had dinner at 7.30, and he was in bed with his ex by 10.30. Well, when they brought Juan's ex in for questioning, it was clear she hadn't known about this affair at all. Uh, but she did know Stacy. She claimed that, you know, Juan basically introduced Stacy as a friend, but she'd always gotten the impression that they were close, but maybe they were t- too close. Like it made her uncomfortable. Yeah. She said Stacy had been at their house for Thanksgiving, Christmas. She would take um, her daughter to get her hair and nails done. She would bring Christmas presents over for the kids. Mm. So it was a, definitely a strange dynamic. Um, but she also did, uh, she did support his alibi. I mean, the police felt that when they broke the news to this woman about the affair, she'd turn on Juan immediately, but they were surprised when she she was like, no, I mean, I'm mad about this. I didn't know, but he was definitely with me that night. Hmm. So they had to go back to the drawing board. They had to clear Juan. They had to go back to the drawing board. Well, they started to suspect that this was a murder for hire situation. The amount of times Richard had been shot seemed like overkill. The fact that he had, you know, nothing of his had been taken eliminated the possibility he'd been killed by a stranger just looking you know for a quick buck right. so they went back to the one piece of evidence they had those tire tracks and they wanted to find a match to the tire tracks which would be like finding a needle in a haystack yeah that's pretty interesting because it's one thing if you have a suspect and then you're kind of able to use it to match to that suspect's vehicles or something like that but if you just have a tire track. It's not like there is, oh, the National Database of Tire Tracks or something <laughs> yeah, like that. That would be good. Uh, yeah, but no. I, I, I wish. But yeah, we, we don't have that. So how, no. how does this go? Well, so they went to um, the tire shops locally. They went to Walmart, BJ's, you know, any place that would sell tires. And they tried to match the tire tracks to a specific brand. And they did. The tracks were made. Um, they were a Goodyear integrity line. But this information didn't really help them because, you know, in this kind of town, there's going to be tons of people who are using Goodyear sure. integrity tires. Um, luckily, they got a tip from an IT tech at the spinal clinic that Stacy ran. Um, he said it was part of his job to go through the company email accounts and clear out unwanted junk mail. But while he was going through Stacy's emails, he noticed something unusual. All the emails from that day, the day of the murder, and then two days before had already been deleted. But he had backups if the police wanted to see them. And of course, they did. So they got a warrant for Stacy's emails. They searched through 4,000 messages before finding two that stood out. The first one was a bank request transfer for $8,902 from a real estate account that belonged to the hospital. Now, that money was transferred into the personal account of a woman named Lenitra Ross. The transfer had gone through two weeks before Richard's murder. Wow. Well, yeah, it's getting crazy. Mm-hmm. They found another transfer to the same woman on February 12th, so two days before Richard's murder. And this was for an additional $1,100, making the total about $10,002. So who was Lenitra Ross and why had Stacy given her $10,000? Apparently, Lenitra was a medical assistant at the spinal clinic where Stacy worked, and she was also renting and living in one of Stacy's properties. The police went to Stacy's house, um, this, the house that Lenitra Ross was living in, and they questioned Lenitra about the purpose of the money. Lenitra claimed that they were for repairs to the rental house. She said there'd been instances of leaking and that the water line needed to be repaired, so Stacy had paid for half of those repairs, and Lenitra had receipts to prove this. The police mm. thought they'd hit a dead end again. Yeah. Um, until Stacy's cousin Connie came forward with some more information. Well, she said, Connie said that Stacy's grandparents had owned a Chevy Impala and they'd given it to Stacy to sell and put the profits of the car sale towards their medical care. Stacy's grandparents were very elderly. They needed round the clock nurses and, and somebody always with them. So they needed to get funds to pay for these nurses and aides. And Stacy claimed she'd sold the Impala for $14,000 and it did disappear from her driveway for some time, but she never came up with the money. Um, and when they finally did track the Impala down, they found it parked in Lenitra Ross's driveway. Uh-oh. And it was equipped with Goodyear Integrity tires, the very same type of tires that had left the marks in the wet ground by Richard's dead body. Right. So the plot thickens, right? Yeah. Yeah. This was too much of a coincidence to be ignored. The investigators turned to cell phone records to help them put the pieces together, and they used what they call a tower dump of information from the cell phone tower that serviced Belton Bridge Park. 
and they began comparing numbers from that tower to Stacy's contact list. And they discovered a number from her phone. Well, they discovered a number that was in her phone had made a call um, from the area of the park right on the night of Richard's murder at around 8.40 p.m. The number was saved in Stacy's contacts as Reggie, a.k.a. Mr. Results. And who Whoa. had Mr. <laughs> yeah. Now, hold on a second. She's so smart. She deletes days of emails all around all this. But in her phone contact, she has someone named Mr. Results. <laughs> Yep, Reggie, a.k.a. Mr. Results. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if you're just being cocky at that point or what. That's, I mean, wow. Wow, wow, wow. Well, I think I know. I think I know why he was in her phone. Or I think I know why she thought she could explain his presence in her phone. Okay. Because who who was Mr. Results? Um, well, who had Mr. Results called that night? He'd called Lenitra Ross, who mm -hmm. was his on-again, off-again girlfriend, and also the father of her child. So Lenitra and Reggie, a.k.a. Mr. Results, um, they they would date sometimes and they'd had a child together. OK, so I feel like maybe um, Stacy would have said, yeah, he's a friend's boyfriend or whatever. And, sure. and that's why he's in there. But his full name was Reginald Coleman, and he was also a personal trainer who in the past had been a professional boxer. And he sometimes gave lunch training sessions at the clinic where Stacy and Lenitra and, and Juan, they all worked there. So now the police had this connection between these three individuals. They began to formulate their theory that Stacy had masterminded the murder of her husband. Yeah. But they they didn't really know why. And they couldn't they couldn't really make a move until they'd figure out a motive and, and gathered some more evidence. So they went back to the cell phone records and looked at the texts from that night. Three minutes after Reggie had called Lenitra, Lenitra had texted Stacy, and this message basically said, hey, I forgot to tell you, I'm going to be late to work tomorrow. By the way, happy Valentine's Day. Um, so the police figured out that this happy Valentine's Day had been a code. It was Lenitra's way of telling Stacy that the deed was done, and she could now go to the park and discover her husband's body. Right. Bank accounts from all three were also examined, and they put the pieces together. They figured out that Lenitra Ross's role had been the go-between to make sure that Reggie got the money from Stacy, um, and in return for her her part in this, she was going to be given the deed to the house, Stacy's house that she lived in, so she could live there rent free for as long as she wanted. Wow. <laughs> yes. And Reggie, Mr. Results, he'd been the recipient of the 10K, and Stacy had also given him her grandparents' Impala as a bonus. Oh, my goodness. Oh, mm -hmm. my goodness. I'm surprised she didn't offer him a job as a doctor also oh, right. and call him Dr. Results. <laughs> Mr. Results, you're going to you're going to come out OK every time or 90 percent of the time, all the time. Right. <laughs> you know, it's so strange because quite honestly, the thing that she's trying to put together, it's one of these crimes I look at and I say that this is kind of brilliant. And. Mm -hmm. I'm really surprised that they were able to pull it back together because she's essentially using a resource to find a different resource. Mm -hmm. And the connectivity between them is all so loose, you know, no. Because direct... they know each other in real life. Yeah, yeah. But mm -hmm. no direct relationship between her and, you know, Mr. or Dr. Results, whatever mm -hmm. you want to consider. Dr. Results, um, MD. <laughs> yeah. So it's just it's really I really like how the investigators use the cell tower dump to mm -hmm. get the communication chain. And then to better understand the communication chain, they looked at the finances. They have to have some really good, like accountant-minded investigators that are able to chew that kind of data up and come out with that. And that's what they kind of said. They said that uh, they thought Stacy went into this thinking like, oh, some, you know, we're not in like the greater Atlanta area. We're in a smaller town. These are some like little town, small town cops. They're never going to be able to figure this out. We're smarter than them. And the cops were like, well, we did. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. They were really, uh, they, they really thought that she had underestimated them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I had a couple of different connections to this. First of all, I used to be a manager at Blockbuster Video. So anytime I hear <laughs> Blockbuster Video get mentioned, I'm like, hey. There's gonna be a time when you say Blockbuster Video and people will have no idea what you're I know, talking about. I know, I mm know, -hmm. yeah, serious. And that time is like tomorrow. I mean, yes, it's, it's practically it's, here already, I know. It is very close. Yeah. <laughs> when Danielle comes back, I'm actually gonna see if she even knows what Blockbuster Video is. 
Um, She'll know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but also the IT guy. And I thought that that was a pretty crucial aspect to all this, too. I mean, for him to note that the emails were deleted and then for him to actually go to the backups and pull that stuff. Yeah, don't try to outsmart your IT guy like that. I mean, it's it's. Um, I had a job in particular where I was responsible for pretty much the same thing, uh, monitoring employee communications. I can't tell you how many different employees got in trouble. Just people use their work email for the worst stuff. I mean, I was finding <laughs> out about like full blown, like prostitution rings that were being yeah. run in the company. I mean, just bizarre. I yeah, crazy, crazy stuff. Um, so it's interesting to me that we had this IT guy kind of step up and help investigators with that information too. And I almost wonder if, because, you know, people must have known at work that she was a strange person, right? Just hiring this random guy and, and making him a surgical assistant. Like, they must have seen and known that something was off about her and, and what she did. And I wonder if the people at work kind of knew more than than they, you know, really let on or that they wanted to talk about because you have Lenitra Ross works there. Right. Reggie comes there for lunch sessions. Right. You've got Stacy hiring her her boyfriend on the side. And I'm sure at work they they were obviously, you know, acting like they they had some sort of relationship. People probably knew what they, was happening. Yeah, they probably knew, but you know, it's a whole different thing when you've got your livelihood on the line. And even if you have you know, the information about something like that to actually put it out and to try to act on it. I mean, all of a sudden you could be looking for a new job really, really quick and your car mm -hmm. payment isn't getting oh, made. I'm sure. yeah. yeah. Or your rent. Unless you start dating Stacy and then all your stuff will get paid. Apparently. For. Yeah. Sugar <laughs> mama. Um, yeah. Did, was it ever clear what the motive was in this particular case? Did she, did she have like a life insurance policy on him or anything? He did have a life insurance policy, but um, that also gets a little complicated. Because the law enforcement had to spend three months gathering evidence to make their case. They kind of suspected her yeah. right off the bat. And they knew what was going on. And they named this investigation Operation Tangled Web as an homage <laughs> to the mess that, that Stacy had you know, basically made her life by lying and deceiving everybody. Yeah. So Operation Tangled Web would end with the arrest of all three simultaneously, essentially. And it needed to go that way. It needed to be perfectly planned because if they grabbed one before the others, it might tip off sure. one of the other two and they would run. The police served seven search warrants and three arrest warrants in four different counties. When they grabbed Reggie first, they got Lenitra in a traffic stop. But when they arrived at the clinic to arrest Stacy, someone in the office had like given her the heads up not to, you know, help her out, but just to basically say, like, the police are here, you know, what's going on? Right. And, and she ran. So she ran deeper into the hospital. So the DeKalb Spinal Clinic, it's located inside of Emory Decatur Hospital. Mm -hmm. So she ran through the hospital. She barricaded herself inside of a room that you had to have a key card to access. <laughs> um, so you couldn't get into it unless you had a hospital key card. And as the police surrounded this room, Stacy knew that the gig was up. She'd eventually have to surrender. So she did. And all three were finally in custody. They questioned them all separately. And Reggie and Lenitra, they denied everything. But mm. Stacy was not with them in their solidarity. So during her interrogation, Stacy admitted to hiring Mr. Results to kill her husband. But she said she had a good reason. Um, one of her sons had told her that Richard had been molesting him. And he said, Mom, you don't know what Richard does to us when you're not home. Mm. And I guess she she took that. He didn't come right out and say that there was any abuse going on, but she took it as that because she said she'd been um, abused when she was a child. So that's, that's kind of where her mind went initially. Um, so according to her, she knew she had to, to protect her children. She knew she had to do something. And to Stacy, that meant having Richard killed. Stacy claimed that she'd confided in Lenitra about this alleged abuse and she vocalized wanting Richard dead. And Lenitra told her that she knew just the guy, Reggie, aka Mr. Results, because this was something he already did on the side to supplement his income. Whoa. <laughs> so wow. I know it's crazy. All three of them cooked up this plan together. They even went to the park before the murder to do a dry run. And while they were there, Reggie was like, oh, this is a perfect place. I might have to actually use this, you know, in my other jobs that I do to supplement my income. Wow. And additionally, it turned out that, no, Richard had not been abusing Stacy's sons at all. Later, her son would say that this comment about Stacy not knowing what Richard was doing when she wasn't home just meant that Richard was strict and he let them get away with less than Stacy would. Wow, that's terrible. <laughs> that's yeah, so and, and I think it was a fake motive and a fake excuse anyways. It sounds honest. like it, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Wow. Well, I suspect that the real reason for Richard's murder was twofold. One, Stacy would know, she would have no idea that like her man on the side, Juan, was trying to reunite with his wife because he was doing everything in his power to convince her that she's the only one. So she continues providing him with money. Um, she'd spent time and money building this relationship, bringing him on romantic trips. Maybe she thought it would turn into more if her husband wasn't there. And also, um, it seemed Richard had a five hundred thousand dollar life insurance policy, hmm. and that might have that might have seemed mighty appealing to Stacy, considering she'd just given away a car and a house and ten thousand dollars. But in the end, all three were found guilty, sentenced to life in prison. Stacy had actually turned on the other two to avoid the death penalty. And after realizing that Stacy had already spilled the beans, Reggie also confessed, but Lenitra Ross, until the very end, denied that she had any involvement. She was still found guilty anyway. Today, Stacy's an inmate in the Pulaski State Prison, and she takes part in the Write a Prisoner program. So here she says she's looking for uplifting and encouraging people on the outside to correspond with. She's continuing her studies in the Word of God and thinks it would be exciting to have prayer partners all over the world. Wow. I was actually considering writing her. Were you really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what would you say? I think I'm going to. I'm just going to be like, hey, um, now that you found God, you know, because everybody finds God when yeah. you go to prison. Now that you have found God, what's the real reason why you did this? I'm just curious. And I feel like she would tell me because what does she have to lose at this point? Yeah. They can't put her in prison again. It's really um, terrible to me to think about this aspect of her children losing both parents effectively mm -hmm, through mm -hmm. this. And I, it's so weird to me that people get so caught up in plans like this and thinking about what the benefits of doing this would be that they lose sight of just the simple things like that. Like what would mm -hmm. this do to my kids if this goes south? You know, You're right. not only are they going to lose their adoptive father, right? Mm -hmm. But on top of that, I'm going to be in jail for the rest of my life. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and, you know, it's hard to determine whether or not Stacy's become a changed woman during her time in prison. Um, yeah. I guess that the moral of the story is uh, love can hurt. And just because someone calls themselves Mr. Results, it doesn't mean it's true unless the result is life in prison. If that's the result you're looking for, then call Reggie, a.k.a. Mr. Results. No joke. No joke. I'm even wondering if if he was being honest about this being a side business, because it sounds like he really botched that one. That's what and I'm thinking. You didn't run into any information about him being related to other murders? No, but that's what I was yeah. thinking. Like, if this is something he does on the side, would they have investigated that and looked into it or tried to get him to confess by offering him maybe a, right. a possibility of parole kind of thing? I don't know. But yeah, there was like I said, there's very mm -hmm. little on the case. Yeah. Um, and I had to kind of piece together a lot of things and, and dig deep. But then I found found some stuff. <laughs> yeah. Well, I knew I called the right person for this because I think <laughs> you laid out a really strong case. And man, I hope my story can take yours on and make this a good competition or I'm going to see a blowout <laughs> in the voting results. But uh, before we get to my story, we have to take a quick break. We'll be right back after this. Heads up, Crime After Crime listeners. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit, is now from $5.66 per serving and it gets even better. Go to hellofresh.com forward slash crime after crime 10 and use code crime after crime 10 during HelloFresh's New Year's sale for 10 free meals, including free shipping. I love HelloFresh and have made some of my best meals ever with their help, including an amazing risotto. But someone else, someone we're missing this episode, might also love HelloFresh and maybe even a little more than me. I actually had HelloFresh for dinner last night and had the leftovers for lunch. I really am a serious fan. Awesome. It helps me so much. And by the way, I don't know their exact name, but I think they're like the enchiladas, the green salsa, the salsa verde enchiladas. Uh oh, yeah. It's yeah. in their Hall of Fame. Do not miss it. If you guys got HelloFresh, if you're using that code and that's on your option, wow. Do not miss it. It's probably, hands down, at this point, one of my favorite meals. Don't miss out on delicious meals that are flexible and will absolutely fit your lifestyle. Even vegetarians like myself can get amazing food from HelloFresh. Go to HelloFresh.com forward slash Crime After Crime 10 and use code Crime After Crime 10 during HelloFresh's New Year's sale for 10 free meals, including free shipping. Say goodbye to endless grocery store trips and eating out too often. Try HelloFresh today. Some people have trouble falling asleep. 
Some have trouble staying asleep. Some people have trouble with both. On average, people are getting less quality sleep than ever before. I went through a real rough patch with my sleep a few years ago, and it was just absolutely terrible. It literally affected everything. My work output was horrible. My relationships were becoming strained. I didn't feel like myself, and I felt like I had no help. Tackling sleep issues shouldn't feel impossible. That's why there's Rim Rise. Their online survey will suggest the perfect blend of all natural herbs and aminos to help you get deeper, more consistent sleep. My blend is called Power Off. I also did the survey, really enjoyable, very quick, and I found out my blend is called Chilled Out. So <laughs> sounds like they got us both right. Rem Rise is a holistic sleep solution. No drugs, no groggy side effects. You can also download the Rem Rise app from the Apple App Store. There's also an Android version coming in 2020. The app allows me to track my mood, sleep duration, stress levels, and you can even connect it to a fitness tracker. The thing I love the most on the app is the guided meditation tracks. Do what I did and check out Rem Rise today. Go to getremrise.com slash crime, take their sleep quiz, and when you sign up, you'll get 25% off your first month of Remrise. You won't find an offer like this anywhere else. Get 25% off your first month of Remrise when you sign up at getremrise.com slash crime, getremrise.com slash crime. After years of having my wife read signs for me and tell me, John, you really need to get glasses, I finally did it. I went to one of those big companies and spent a small fortune on my first pair. It's great being able to see again. I just wish I didn't see that my wallet took such a hit. Don't make the same mistake that I did. Check out Warby Parker. Warby Parker creates boutique quality eyewear at revolutionary price points. Prescription glasses starting at just $95, and that's with anti-glare and anti-scratch coatings. What's even cooler is for every pair bought, they donate a pair to someone in need. I love supporting companies that give back like this. Their process is also easy and fun. They have a home try-on program that is absolutely free. Order five pair of glasses and try them on for free for five days. There's no obligation to buy at all. Ships free and includes prepaid return shipping label. Head to warbyparker.com forward slash crime after crime to take the quiz and order your free home try-on. Do you wear contacts? Check out Scout by Warby Parker. Comfortable, breathable, and affordable daily contact lenses made from a super moist material that resists drying for lasting hydration and comfort. Order a trial pack that includes six days worth of contacts for only $5. Then receive $5 off your next Warby Parker order. Learn more at warbyparker.com forward slash crime after crime. Save money on your next pair of glasses and help others with Warby Parker. Welcome back, and please support these amazing companies that believe in crime after crime. So now it's John's turn. It's John's turn to try to tap the crazy story of Stacy and her merry band of uh, assassins, I guess. Can you do it, John? Can <laughs> Seriously, you do it? yeah. Um, I don't know. I'm sweating a little bit, but I'm going to give it my best shot. According to reports from American Express, typical Valentine's Day spending averages over $200 per person in gifts, with men spending about 20% more than women. But that's not accounting for a major expense that some people have that day. Every Valentine's Day, literally millions of people get engaged. In 2012, about 4 million people got engaged, and that number increased to 6 million the following year. The average cost of an engagement ring in 2013 was $2,410. But let's be honest, ladies, and Stephanie, you tell me, who wants an average engagement ring, right? Nobody. He went to Jared. <laughs> <laughs> crime after no, crime. they say you went to Jared's? <laughs> yeah, crime after crime. Not sponsored by Jared. But <laughs> not yeah, sponsored. It's, it's good to know he went to Jared's. 22-year-old <laughs> Ramsey Fakuri was in love. He met his girlfriend a few years prior at Indiana Bible College, and they were now in a long-distance relationship. He knew it had been long enough. It was time for them to take the big plunge, and he even had a special ring picked out for her. But there was a huge problem. The ring had a price tag of $13,000. What? 13000 That's 
un- that's unnecessary. That's excessive. <laughs> oh, you right? think it's excessive? I think it's yes. cheap. But uh, you should see the you rock on my no, wife. <laughs> no, 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 I don't. Thirteen thousand. That's 000, a car, that's... man. <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> Ramsey didn't have the cash for the engagement ring for his would-be fiance, but being a good problem solver, he thought of places that did have cash, and one quickly came to mind. His girlfriend worked at a bank. Kismet. Perfect. Yeah, we, we can work this out. <laughs> For some reason, he seemed to forget that there are other banks much closer to his hometown of Troy, Michigan. His girlfriend's bank was literally hundreds of miles away in Highland, Illinois. But he had a plan and he was sticking to it. He spoke to a friend of his, 18-year-old Alexander Girth, and talked him into helping out. Ramsey called his girlfriend and began asking questions about her workplace. She didn't know that he had her on speakerphone and Alexander was listening in. They were getting the details they needed to solve Ramsey's little cash problem so he could become the man of his girlfriend's dreams. Mm. Don't, don't we all need a guy like that, Stephanie? Yeah. Yeah. I feel bad for Ramsey now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll see how this Not turns out. Long. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like a lot of other guys, Ramsey also waited until the last minute. It was Valentine's Day 2014, a Friday. Ramsey and Alexander drove all through the night to get to the bank before opening in Ramsey's blue 2008 Mustang. They arrived a little early and stopped at a nearby Walmart. They then drove over to the Bradford National Bank and parked near it. They could see Ramsey's girlfriend pull into the lot, park, and enter the bank. She apparently didn't recognize his car, or did she? All of a sudden, Ramsey's phone started ringing, and it was her. But she was calling just to say good morning. She had no idea that he was right outside her workplace. They were in the clear. Around 8.30 a.m., the female branch manager came outside. She was restocking the drive-up ATM when Alexander put on a mask, approached her holding a gun, and told the woman to empty the ATM. She did, handing over nearly $26,000 in cash, and then she was ordered to lay on the ground by the masked robber. Thankfully, she was not injured, but she was absolutely terrified. Alexander ran off, jumped in the car, and Ramsey drove the Mustang as they made their getaway. Okay, I have a question. Yeah. So the the wedding ring was how much? 13,000? 13,000. And he got twenty six thousand. Do you you think Ramsey would buy a twenty six thousand dollar engagement ring, or would he just consider the extra as like a bonus for his hard work and, well, and smart thinking? And he's working someone else in on this. You know, oh, can't get your friend Alexander. to do it for free. Yeah. Maybe there's someone that Alexander wants to marry too. But yeah, <laughs> twenty six grand that they got Oof. in that, and apparently they just they absolutely the event just completely terrified this woman. Um, yes. Yeah. I mean, it, I can't imagine having someone waving a gun around at me. And but did you that. see? I I retweeted it on Twitter. It says you have one job, and then it's a guy robbing a store, and he comes in with the gun, and he like goes to hold it up, and he accidentally throws it oh across God. the counter at her. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not a good way to do it, though. Um, so. What I did wonder about this, and I looked when I was looking into the story, is why are they restocking the ATM like from the outside? I thought most ATMs are attached to the building, and they actually do it from the inside. But this is a drive-up ATM that's like on an island out away from the main structure. So they literally are just carrying loads of cash out to that yeah. ATM and, and I thought the I thought the people who brought the trucks, you know, the Brinks, I think it's called Brinks or something. Mm-hmm. They're like an armored truck and there's money. I thought they did yeah. that. Yeah, not. I don't think they do it for, for ATM refills. I think they just go to, huh. to do major pickups. But so these guys make their getaway. On the road, they switched drivers and Ramsey counted the cash. 16,000 for him and 10000 would go to his buddy Alexander. He could easily buy that ring now and even start wedding plans with the additional money. While they were driving, Ramsey started getting texts from his girlfriend about the terrible ordeal and the fact that she was an eyewitness. She was literally watching this go down from inside the bank. Ramsey took Alexander to Indianapolis and jumped on a Greyhound bus heading back to Illinois under the guise that he was now going out there to support his traumatized girlfriend. Alexander took Ramsey's car back to Michigan. Ramsey arrived at the St. Louis bus station around midnight. His girlfriend and her father showed up to pick him up. I wonder if he was thinking, 
is this a good time to ask her dad for her hand in marriage? He probably was. Yeah. <laughs> oh, he absolutely I mean, yeah, probably was. You've got the rest of this plan going so good at this point. You, you just tip the dad like a hundred bucks, you know, he's yeah. a big baller now. There you go. They, they headed back to the family's home where Ramsey's girlfriend was being comforted by her caring boyfriend who she had no idea was one of the guys outside sticking up her coworker or that he had a gym bag full of stolen cash in her family's home. He actually brought the cash back and had it on him and it was now in her family's house. The case was being investigated by local authorities with the Highland Police Department as well as the FBI. They noticed a blue Mustang passing through the parking lot a few times that morning on the video and they began tracing it using traffic cameras and other sources. Two days later, authorities released two images to the media and texted the images to Ramsey's girlfriend. They had traced that blue Mustang to a stop at a local Walmart and had security camera footage of two men. As soon as she saw them, she confronted Ramsey. He admitted that he was one of the men in the photos, but said he had nothing to do with the bank robbery. She drove Ramsey to the Highland Police Department where Ramsey was going to try to convince them that he was not part of the robbery. Like so many other parts of this story, that also didn't go according to plan. Ramsey was arrested and would quickly confess, also telling officers who the other person was. A day later, Alexander was also arrested back in Michigan, and in his backpack, they found the gun. It was actually an airsoft pellet gun. Police were able to recover most of the stolen cash, though apparently Alexander had purchased several real guns and two iPads with his take. While a lot of people are celebrating their, spring, their springtime weddings, Ramsey and Alexander were pleading guilty to the robbery. The felony charge could have landed them up to 20 years in prison and a $250,000 fine. In July of 2014, Ramsey was sentenced to six and a half years behind bars, and the following month, Alexander got nearly five years. According to a LinkedIn profile, Ramsey may have turned his life around. It states that he got his AA and is pursuing his bachelor's, and he appears to be employed and contributing to society. However, I'm also seeing several inmate websites, and they're saying that he's actually still in jail and not scheduled to be released until March 2020, but I think that might just be outdated information. My hopes are that the LinkedIn profile is accurate. Perhaps he got released early for good behavior, and maybe we can see the DB Tuber ending happen for this guy, where he gets his life back on track and becomes known for more than a series of really bad decisions when he was younger. I can find no information on if Ramsey or his girlfriend stayed together. As a matter of fact, I couldn't even find her name through this. Um, they were really good about keeping her private. I think they were worried because she was an eyewitness, so her identity was never released to the press. But that is the story of Ramsey and his plans to get the $13,000 engagement ring. A big thank you to the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, the Huffington Post, Daily Mail, Washington Times, Justice.gov, and FBI.gov for information contributing to today's story. And by the way, Stephanie, on the way to the robbery, when they were driving all through the night, they also got a speeding ticket. <laughs> <laughs> It's just, it's like a Harold and Kumar movie, honestly. Like, it just feels like, <laughs> and they're like in the car, you know, arguing like, oh, who's going to put the mask on and actually do this, man? You do it. You look better in a mask. <laughs> you know, I can just see it's like such a, oh no, they're not professional criminals. That's for sure. <laughs> no, no. And I, I really, I. I'm not lying when I say I hope that LinkedIn profile is accurate. Of course, the LinkedIn profile doesn't say that, you know, he served time anywhere. And it it seems to say that he was working a job for the time that he was probably yeah, actually was present. Yeah. yeah, probably incarcerated. But I do hope that uh, these guys are both straightening their lives out and making good Why choices. Why do I feel like his girlfriend wasn't on it, though? I was wondering about that as I was researching this whole thing. And the call, you know, like how she called him to say good morning. Was that a call like the manager's about to go out and put the money in the ATM machine? Yes. But he loved her so much, he couldn't give her a ring, but he could get her a non-prison sentence. He was like, I got you into this, honey. Yeah. I'm going to out of it. Yeah. I really wondered about that as well. Um, but it's really tough because... Because they were protecting her identity, there is no 
aspects of her being interviewed so you can understand mm-hmm. her side of the story or even see if she's got like a criminal background or something yeah. which i don't think she would if she works at a bank probably not probably not and um it is interesting that when the pictures kick out you know it seems like they're acting pretty quick in terms of she's taking him right to the police station for him to go talk to them uh, under whatever guise it is, even if it's it's him actually going to confess or not. But I imagine that would have been a tough conversation because, you know, according to her point of view, he wasn't in the area. He brought he rode the bus in later. I mean, they picked him up from the bus station. First of all, why did he take the bus if he had a car? Like, what was the excuse he gave her about, like, you know, maybe... Probably because Alexander had to take the car back home, right? So if they were already driving back away from the area yeah they couldn't turn right back around well and you wouldn't want to right i mean if you just robbed a bank you wouldn't want to get that getaway car and just go driving it back through town (laughs) but in terms of explaining it to his girlfriend how would you explain that yeah i didn't bring my car i just hopped on the bus i mean it's cheaper sometimes you just like to maybe when you want to read something or do a crossword puzzle. Oh, that's such a Stephanie answer. Maybe if you mm-hmm. wanted to read something. <laughs> like a Sudoku, you know. <laughs> Go to Sudoku. You can't drive. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. That's a great point of view. Yeah, I, I think that's it's relaxing. Yeah. I like the train and I like buses. They're nice and fun. And I yeah. don't like planes because I'm scared they're going to crash. But <laughs> <laughs> but that is, that is weird about this story. Um, I, I really don't know if she had any involvement there. And even... If they used the information that they learned from her about how to rob that particular bank, couldn't they have applied it somewhere else? Better or better? (laughs) Well, better, definitely. But couldn't they have also applied it somewhere else? Like find another bank that has that same setup where they've got an ATM away from the actual structure. I mean, it's just it's so weird to me that it happened back at that location. But and and the thing is, I feel like her working there would almost make him more of a suspect because when you know that happens, they're always going to look at the employees first. They're always going to wonder if it's an inside job sure, first. Sure. Sure. Yeah, right. You know. Yeah. Yeah, Maybe absolutely. I've watched too many Ocean's Eleven movies, though. I don't know. <laughs> I also love whenever Walmart comes into a story <laughs> and plays an interesting role like it does with this one. Uh, it usually comes up in Florida Man stories. There's a lot of Walmart relations. but so, There was Walmart in my story, too. Yeah. 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 That's right. <laughs> yeah. And people need to just understand Walmart is stacked with surveillance cameras. If you're going to go to Walmart before you commit a crime, just park in a different parking lot, walk over, get some exercise. It's okay. Oh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, There's even some people that are worried that like, because, you know, um, the the family that owns Walmart, they're pretty close with big political figures like presidents and stuff. And Mm -hmm. uh, some people think that Walmart is basically like a data collection system for, you know, the NSA that, you know, your images are being taken as you're walking in and they're associating everything with your records and they know where you go. And uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. They're using Walmart for that. It's not a really good sampling of the general population. I think. Uh, yeah, well, have you ever seen those people at Walmart videos? <laughs> I have seen some Walmart videos. <laughs> More like a scientific experiment, like study. <laughs> Uh, this episode of Crime After Crime also not sponsored by Walmart. No, uh, we're not. Yeah. <laughs> not sponsored by Walmart. <laughs> All right. Uh, as usual, there were other stories that we ran into during our research. And I'm going to start with the one about two love struck teenagers in China attempted to rob a jewelry store on Valentine's Day. And it was so exciting to them, they decided to stop for some making out in the middle of the robbery. They chose a terrible location, though right in front of a surveillance camera. The footage helped the police track down and arrest the criminal lovers. The store owner was quoted as saying, they were amateurs because apart from the cash, they did not take anything of value. There were cameras and laptop computers and smartphones, and they left it all behind because they were so busy kissing. (laughs) By the way- First of all, I disagree with that store owner, okay? (laughs) I disagree. First of all, nothing of value besides the cash. Cash is more valuable than anything. Number two, maybe they knew that they couldn't pawn this stuff because it would lead back to them. Number three, everybody thinks they're Bonnie and Clyde. So interesting. Yeah, definitely. I think it's definitely easier to track like, uh, you know, serial numbers in a diamond. Sure, of course. Than serial numbers on a dollar. But there's a little twist to this, Stephanie. Um, They only stole two hundred and sixteen (laughs) dollars. Wait, was there more there, though, or was that all that was there? I think that's all that was probably in the register. That's like That sounds like they just had change in the register, basically. Well, they're not greedy. You know, they just want enough. <laughs> Have a nice dinner, maybe. 
Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Let, let's hear one, Stephanie. What you got? All right. Well, in Portland, Oregon, on Valentine's Day 2012, police were dispatched when they started receiving calls about a woman's bound a woman bound in the back of a car. Oh, they caught up to the vehicle and found 32 year old Nicholas Harbor and 26 year old Stephanie. Oh, so they're always Stephanie. It's always Stephanie. It's Stephanie always a Stephanie. Yep. Why? Who? <laughs> and they were indeed naked and bound. However, Stephanie told them that her and her boyfriend were simply role playing. Police weren't amused, arresting them both and charged them with the disorderly conduct. They wound up doing 16 hours of community service. Come on, man. Leave leave Stephanie and Nicholas alone. <laughs> They're trying to spice it up. Yeah, but they scared people. They're driving around with her tied up in the back of a car <laughs> and she's naked. I'm sorry. It's not funny, but I just imagined seeing that. And yes, it would be. <laughs> yeah. It might be a little terrifying. Yeah, absolutely. Come back there. All right. Well, you yeah. You had to get all fuzzy <laughs> over that. Um, in Phoenix, Arizona, on Valentine's Day 2014, Joseph Kadenip, a man serving time in jail, climbed two walls and crawled through razor wire, all to get to a date with his sweetheart at a nearby saloon. He was caught a few hours after his escape, but they had to take him to a hospital to get treated for his cuts before taking him back to jail. Now that is love, folks. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's dedication. Yeah, he, he, he obviously promised to be at that date before he, uh, he got incarcerated. And uh, yeah, I'm going to get there one way or another. <laughs> well, apparently not everyone is into Valentine's Day. A man in Shanghai was so burned by Valentine's Day, he tried to ruin it for everyone else. Now, he bought every other seat in a movie theater. And, and from what I remember, it was like a really popular romance movie yeah. that was out at the time. And, and then he went to an online forum and posted, want to see a movie on Valentine's Day? Sorry, you'll have to sit separately. So, what so petty. And I, I'm not sure how he'd enforce that either. Yeah, yeah, seriously. What are you gonna jump from seat to seat when you see, hey, that's my seat actually. <laughs> You just wasted your money. And yeah, you were foolish. Yeah, so so weird. I mean, I mean, I guess you know, people have different feelings about Valentine's Day. I get it, but why ruin it for other people, man? Just buy your just seat. Just drink a bottle of wine like everybody else and cry <laughs> into your chocolate box. Yeah, exactly. Go to karaoke. <laughs> yes. Uh, if you'd like to see even more Valentine's Day criminal nonsense, check out Ranker.com's list called "20 Shocking Valentine's Day Crimes Committed by Lovers." <laughs> who's gonna win this month audience you vote for me. <laughs> oh she's saying quietly for me no don't do that she just wanted the whole youtube vote <laughs> all right all right well who had the best valentine's day and crime story and i was i was honestly really like digging yours because i had this whole picture going on in my head yeah yeah, yeah. i'm i'm really i don't know which way it's gonna go um I think mine's a little bit lighter. It's it's kind of yes. silly, which you know kind of matches me a little yeah. bit. <laughs> but, and mine is dark and twisted, which matches me quite well. Yeah, as well. <laughs> and it is certainly a tangled web that you brought to <laughs> to your story. Why do the police always name these operations? <laughs> I know, I know. How much time do they spend coming up with it? You know, they're like, before we even investigate this, guys, we need to come up with a name. Let's all get together, <laughs> brain such like brainstorming session right now. Yeah, yeah. What's the name of the operation? Well, they got it perfect on that one. They did. It, they really it did. was a tangled web, but they were able to <laughs> track it down. All right. So you can vote at the Twitter account at Crime After Pod, and you can vote there for seven days after the episode debuts, or you can also vote on YouTube. Look for a little eye in the upper right hand corner. Click on that and you'll see you can vote up there for our next episode coming back will be danielle hallen and we're going to be talking about criminal athletes and even though she's not here i'm instituting a no oj rule we will not use oj as one of the stories <laughs> <laughs> Though we might talk about it maybe a little before or after. We'll see. Um, you can find myself, Danielle Hallen, and Stephanie Harlow at our YouTube channels. Just search for us. You can also find us on social media. I know we're all on Twitter. And you can also come out and meet us at CrimeCon in Orlando, May 1st through the 3rd. If you do, be sure to use code CRIMEAFTER2020 and you will get 10% off. Plus, 
let us know if you do use our code, seriously. Like email us at crimeaftercrime at lordandarts.com because you are going to get something special when you come to meet us, and that's just for our closest fans. If you have ideas you want to submit for us to consider for future episodes of Crime After Crime, please email crimeaftercrime at lordandarts.com or follow us on Twitter and let us know there at crimeafterpod. Crime After Crime is produced and hosted by Daniel Hallen and John Lorden with today's very special guest host and researcher, Stephanie Harlow. And a big thank you to our patrons. If you join on Patreon, you will get a bonus Patreon special every single month. This month, we have special guest host Stephanie Harlow joining us for the Patreon special. And that conversation is really fun. You guys don't want to miss that. Plus, patrons get a personal shout out in an upcoming Patreon special. Also, be sure to check out our merch store at teespring.com forward slash stores forward slash crime after crime. You can buy your own mug. I'm really missing the mug. And now it's going to be another month. Um, <laughs> and I don't know if I'm winning it back. So we're going to see next month. Um, but we will see you on the next Crime After Crime. But before we cut out, I just want to know, Stephanie, did you enjoy yourself? Yeah, this was fun. I was actually, um, every time you say Crime After Crime, I yeah. sing Time After Time in my head. <laughs> every time. We had someone come up to the table at CrimeCon last year, and they started singing Time After mm -hmm. Time, but they were saying Crime After Crime. Yeah. 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 We, you need to make that happen. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. I love that song. <laughs> it was awesome. Thank you so much for having me. I had a good time. Thank you. Thank you, really. And I know uh, Danielle would also say the same thing. Thank you for stepping in. Thank you for doing no such problem. a strong showing. And <laughs> keep in mind, whoever wins this episode, we've got a donation going to either St. Jude's or the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, two very good organizations. Both really good. Yeah, that's what yeah. I was going to say. Both so really good. Don't forget to vote if you enjoyed this show please rate or review us on whatever platform you found us on and the best way you can help others find us is to talk about it tell your friends tell your family tell everyone that you love crime after crime we'll see you next month take care everybody bye